the poem under discussion inexorably demands comparison with you are Anandamurthy's best known work, Samskara, which of course was translated into English from Kannada by A.K. Ramanujan. Please don't say that I'm going overboard. This is the way to study literature. There is no point in studying a work of literature in isolation. You should always try to relate the work you are studying with other works of literature, with other works of art, not just with other things in literature, other things in art, but also with things in history, in politics, in sociology, in economics. T.S. Eliot used to say that in order to get a better understanding of a Shakespeare play, it is not sufficient to study the play in isolation, but that one has to take an effort to relate the play to the complex of, to the network of, to the grid of Shakespeareana. Returning to small-scale reflections on a great house, it certainly demands comparison with you are Anandamurthy's samskara. Small-scale reflections on a great house turns the spotlight on the decline, the degeneration of a great house, obviously belonging to a Brahmin family. Samskara is the narrative of the decay, of the degeneration of an Agraharam or a Brahmin settlement on the Konkan coast. The poem is moving towards its close and the poet takes care to provide it with a very impressive, with a dramatic concluding section. The underlying thesis of the narrative of the poem is that everything that goes out returns. Everything that goes out of the so-called great house comes back. Now, we are going to meet a very different kind of coming back. The poet says that this kind of coming back took place twice. First, in 1943. In 1943, the Second World War was at its peak. The Second World War began in 1939 and concluded in 1945, if I'm not wrong. I'm not wrong because I remember that according to family lore, my maternal grandfather, who was a doctor in the Madras Presidency Service, was absorbed into the British Indian Army and posted in Madras in 1942. But that is not what I am here to talk about. The poet says that the strange kind of coming back took place twice, once in 1943. Who came back? By the time we conclude reading the poem, we realize that a nephew came back. He came back from the Sahara. He came back half gnawed by desert foxes. The Sahara is the biggest hot desert in the world. It's in Africa. And you must remember that Africa, the deserts of Africa, were an important theater of war during the Second World War. So this nephew returns to the house, half gnawed by desert foxes. Desert foxes are foxes of the desert, a kind of fox you find in the desert. A variety of foxes, species of fox that you find in the desert. 
No means to bite, to nibble, to bite persistently, to bite repeatedly. The nephew had been bitten repeatedly, nibbled repeatedly, gnawed by desert foxes. It is interesting to note that Erwin Rommel, Erwin Rommel, the brilliant German general, was known as the desert fox and he played a very significant role in the Second World War. The second instance given by the poet is of a nephew who, who returns from somewhere in the north, probably from Kashmir. I think the word nephew used in the fourth last stanza of the poem, last line of the fourth last stanza of the poem is applicable to both the incidents. In both the incidents, it is, it is nephews who return to the house. In the second instance, the nephew is a person with stripes on his shoulder, which means he's a pilot. Pilots wear bars or stripes on their epaulets, indicating their service, indicating their rank. And this boy is a pilot. He is called an incident on the border. Very interesting. The press release of the government describes him now, not as a person, not as a pilot, but as an incident on the border. And how does he return? He does not come back. He is brought back. There is a lot of difference between coming back and being brought back. In this case, the nephew is brought back. And he reaches the great house, the so-called great house, even before the telegrams reach. I'm not sure whether you are aware what a telegram is. In the good old days, we had telegrams, which supposedly moved faster than ordinary letters. Telegrams were supposed to be a faster mode of communication than letters were. The story goes that a Malayali soldier posted in Kashmir was suddenly granted leave by his commanding officer and the boy decided to return home. He did not want to take his mother by surprise and so he wrote her a letter. He also sent a telegram. He posted a letter, he sent a telegram, and then he set out for Kerala. The boy reached his house first. The letter reached his mother after that. And still later, the telegram reached his mother. The mother who was upset by all this, took the letter and the telegram to the postmaster general in Tiruvarantapuram and demanded an explanation for the same. Why has the letter traveled faster than the telegram? The postmaster general said, Madam, PNT department, post and telegraph department. Post comes first. So a letter always arrives first. A telegram arrives only after the letter arrives.